Good evening. We are broadcasting on the iForum of the Civic Dialogue, and we shall be talking about democracy in the post Soviet uh, states. Yesterday, I uh, had a conversation with Yuri Petrovich uh, Sinakosov, uh, uh, one of the uh, co founders uh, um, of the Moscow School, uh, and he um, gave an interesting uh, concept as uh, democracy as uh, some space, a space which allows us uh, to uh, coexist, uh, live together and work together. We shall be sharing our opinions and views about the evolvement and indeed the evolution of this uh, open space of democracy in the post-Soviet states. Uh, and of course, while the experience of these post-Soviet uh, states has been uh, different, uh, and it is indeed uh, a great... Uh, a source of great uh, chagrin that the Russian language has been the source, uh, source of, uh, of, um, of Soviet propaganda. But uh, I am happy today that in the Russian language we shall uh, hear the opinions uh, and the viewpoints of our experts from the Ukraine, Armenia, uh, Georgia, Kazakhstan, and it will also sound in the simultaneous interpretation. So, um, uh, as uh, delivered by Mark Dadian, and you can be following the simultaneous interpretation in the English version of our website. Sapere how the the Kantian formula is uh, the uh, motto of the Moscow School, and uh, we assume that this uh, meeting uh, will be interesting because we all dare, uh, uh, we dare to think um, uh, freely. Uh, our first speaker uh, will talk generally about post-Soviet space. Uh, Mikhail Minakov, President of the Foundation for Quality Politics and Assistant Professor of Kiev Mohyliansky Academy in the Ukraine. Hello, Mikhail. Uh, yes, uh, uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Excellent. Uh, I'm very glad to see you all. Uh, and I can see your faces. Uh, there are a couple of icons uh, which are still obscure. However, I hope uh, uh, we're all. It's it's great that we're on one of the same network. Uh, and I'm happy that we can discuss the situation uh, in which we find ourselves 24 years uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and indeed the 30th anniversary of the Perestroika in 1985. Perestroika. Uh, started the uh, processes uh, which uh, indeed brought us uh, to uh, what we see today. However, with all the importance of 1985, it was indeed 1991 that became the time, uh, the starting point, uh, indeed uh, the break point uh, of uh, the mass uh, projects of uh, a national uh, n uh, uh, nature in uh, different countries which at one time um, uh, were a part of the Soviet uh, Union. And in different uh, um, uh, parts of this uh, uh, ex country, uh, we could see that the so called uh, industrial modern modernity was uh, supplanted uh, with the uh, nightmare of unpredictability. In the beginning, it seemed that uh, uh, the greatest uh, political uh, pro uh, uh, project may start. However, the freedom of entrepreneurship was indeed supplanted uh, with oligarchy and uh, uh, democracy with, uh, uh, with uh, authoritarianism. And the dreams of modernization at the beginning of the 19th uh, led uh, to a world which was indeed uh, uh, which is indeed being uh, strictly demodernized in 2014 and 2015. Interestingly, uh, that uh, we see some very interesting chiasms, uh, uh, the reality. What reality uh, do we see today? On uh, the year of the short shooting of the Russian parliament, the Russian Federation was posited uh, as a democratic state with a rule of law. Uh, and uh, and the Republican form of government. At the same time, uh, the Russian parliament was shot at. Uh, uh, the freedoms of the uh, of, of a human and the human rights were perceived to be the highest uh, ideal of uh, of uh, the Russian state. Uh, 
on uh, in the year when uh, oligarchy, and I'm now uh, quoting from the experience of the Ukraine, uh, 1996, uh, when the Ukraine was positive to be a country of uh, democracy uh, with the um, rule of law and the human rights uh, uh, and uh, the well-being of the citizens of the Ukraine are believed to be the highest uh, value for the state. The state is responsible for uh, people, uh, and uh, uh, the state is responsible to uh, safeguard the freedoms, liberties, and the well-being. Uh, let us take the example of the Republic of Kazakhstan, which uh, uh, indeed acknowledges uh, the value of the human life and the rights of a human being to be the supreme value. Uh, the rights and liberties of men are the highest uh, value. Uh, and uh, indeed the objective uh, and the essence of the statehood, uh, which is uh, a quotation from the Belarus Constitution of 1994. These all beautiful phrases have indeed uh, failed to become reality in most of these countries. None of these phrases, none of these stipulations uh, may uh, be uh, viewed as part of the economic and political uh, reality today. However, uh, these, uh, uh, and in, in philosophy, we call this uh, an illocutive uh, meaning. Uh, they were indeed uh, uh, manifesting uh, the uh, aspiration of the big groups or the elites uh, to become modern. And noble phrases uh, uh, were to give uh, the maintenance uh, uh, air uh, for the grievances which were going to uh, uh, and become the reality in these uh, post-Soviet uh, states. Uh, so all of the main um, stipulations of the post-Soviet constitutions uh, of the um, beginning of the 1990s are fruits of political imagination and, uh, and, uh, and an attempt to, to project the future. Uh, and these texts uh, in the constitutions uh, uh, indeed uh, show some care for the future. Uh, thus, uh, we, the people of the Republic of Belarus, being responsible for the present and the future of Belarus, we, the people, the multinational people of the Russian Federation, uh, while uh, acknowledging our responsibility for this and the future um, generations, this uh, revolutionary novelty and a certain air of utopia were what uh, constituted to the legitimacy of the post-Soviet political project. A new life in uh, the 15, uh, because it was believed to be just 15 regimes or 15 governments to spring on the uh, debris of the USSR, were to bring in something new, a dream uh, of becoming a, a new society, um, uh, getting up above and over uh, the old. However, 20 years later, uh, the novelty got supplanted uh, with a pessimistic myth. And indeed, uh, this uh, uh, past, which has not been buried, as Alexander Etkin wrote in a recent book, uh, came back with vengeance and is determining uh, the um, contemporary political reality in the post-Soviet space. Uh, for the past uh, 20 years, we have lived in a world which was, in a way, a laboratory of history. We have been experimenting with political regimes, uh, imagining ourselves uh, how a capitalism and a democracy should be like. And this post-Soviet uh, idea, or post-Soviet uh, uh, chimera of what capitalism and democracy are, uh, uh, were born, uh, generated in a very strange, uh, whimsical um, uh, uh, fruits. Uh, indeed, uh, the late Soviet modernity um, predetermined uh, such of these attitudes, some of the, and the collapse or the breakup uh, uh, of the Soviet Union led to a situation when the Soviet Union got multiplied in a fantastical way and the expectations of democracy, the experiments uh, with politics and uh, the economy uh, brought to a situation started to recreate the different uh, attitudes and the different dimensions of the Soviet reality, in, in, which means that uh, the Soviet Union, far from uh, dying, uh, acquired a new life. Uh, 
in many different forms uh, and the Soviet regime in Belarus, the Soviet regime in Transnistria, uh, and uh, what can you uh, talk about uh, Abkhazia, what is happening in South Ossetia, what is happening in Nagorno in the mountainous Karabakh. There are spaces and pieces of space, pieces of uh, uh, territories uh, uh, where this uh, post-Soviet experiment uh, is especially um, radical. Probably today the most uh, terrible experiments are taking place on the territories of the so-called Donetsk and, uh, and uh, Lugansk uh, uh, People's uh, Republics. Most unexpected uh, categories and most unexpected uh, attitudes uh, um, mar the reality and lead to terrible tragedies. The breakup of the Soviet Union allowed the newly emergent republics uh, to uh, launch their own political project. And as we remember, uh, the constitutional framework uh, allowed uh, for these liberal or national liberal ideas uh, of launching the market uh, democracy, where the uh, private property rights uh, are um, guarded, uh, and uh, there is uh, this uh, social um, uh, this, uh, the social um, uh, security of uh, the later Soviet uh, times uh, should also or should have also been kept. A modernization impulse of 1991 led to uh, the review of the Soviet uh, uh, project, um, of which uh, some most important were the revolutionary uh, novelties between uh, the, in the relations between the public space and the private sphere. The public sphere uh, was to become uh, the locomotive uh, and uh, of uh, the change, and uh, the private sphere uh, was indeed uh, to become uh, the domain of uh, private life, including sex uh, um, and uh, spiritual uh, search, uh, religion, and indeed. Uh, Oh, we can see this uh, as a very important thing. It would be very, very interesting to hear about uh, these uh, opinions of how the rooting of democracy, uh, indeed uh, the elites passed uh, from, uh, from Marx uh, into the Friedrich List type of closed-in, isolated national states. Democracy must have become very, very uh, um, uh, rooted, uh, very national. Uh, the so-called uh, um, ideas of uh, Cossacks uh, in the Ukraine, Veche in Russia, uh, same in Belarus, and this romantic nationalism was uh, indeed uh, uh, distracting people from uh, the need uh, to reform their societies. And in such a way, the myth uh, started to, to uh, they became the champions of demodernization or demodernizing post-Soviet countries. Um, indeed uh, were uh, immediately um, divided into those which were able to reform quickly, like the Baltic states, those uh, which reformed the economy but were not uh, swift uh, to um, modernize the political system, like Russia and the Ukraine, and finally uh, those countries which were very quick to stop the reform, like Belarus and uh, and um, you know, some of the Central Asian countries. In this sense, uh, Belarus became uh, the flagship of such demodernizing or demodernization. And uh, uh, the Belarus nationalists uh, of the beginning uh, of the 90s, uh, the populist uh, with the neo Soviet uh, rhetoric uh, uh, brought uh, to the fore Mr. Lukashenko, uh, who was uh, originally viewed as a, as a uh, uh, whim of the Soviet province, uh, however, and that uh, this would have been uh, uh, indeed uh, uh, washed away in the next elections. However, um, Mr. Lukashenko's uh, projects and uh, his, uh, uh, his uh, political uh, maneuvers led to an entirely different uh, reality. And indeed, uh, uh, we're talking about elites uh, which uh, try to not to, 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 to uh, avoid uh, formalization of their rule or the rules of the game. Indeed, uh, uh, the decisions of the presidential administration are not to be debated. The logic of this institution was indeed uh, continued in the uh, subsequent uh, 
in the subsequent um, style of the so-called vertical of authority. And indeed, we were seeing the uh, emergence uh, of uh, almost feudal uh, relationships. Moving across uh, the post-Soviet uh, uh, cities uh, and uh, towns, uh, we indeed saw the erosion of the principles of a constitutional republic and uh, the um, the division of power uh, or the system of checks and balances, uh, which was indeed being eroded by these uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, ramifications uh, of uh, authoritarianism. The arrival into these new organizations of new civil servants and the new politicians uh, were not particularly instrumental in changing the situation. Uh, thus, uh, uh, we were talking about uh, while there was a no uh, state ideology, um, we could see that, uh, such as uh, Svetlana Parichina, uh, uh, who was speaking about uh, the ideology of Belarus, uh, it is that uh, ideology for a state is the same as an immune system for an organism. If the immunity gets weaker, uh, then indeed any infection becomes lethal. Uh, and if ideology gets eroded, uh, then uh, any um, external or internal factor may uh, indeed uh, uh, lead uh, to the dissolution of the state. I think that Mr. Putin may have well repeated these words, and we can see many leaders even in Kiev uh, ready to repeat this. So, uh, we can see uh, these uh, generalized uh, statements, and uh, indeed uh, this is becoming more and more important uh, for the uh, uh, new regime. So, we're seeing this uh, as an interesting uh, difference. Uh, in different uh, countries, and uh, we have even seen such economic practices which have been supported by the oligarchs and then uh, the authoritarian regimes. Uh, the uh, fight uh, of the red uh, uh, directors uh, and the criminal um, uh, mafia bosses and the uh, former apparatchiks in the beginning of the 90s were uh, immediately uh, related uh, to the uh, division uh, and the, and the, indeed the, the greedy uh, uh, swallowing of the big chunks of uh, the one-time Soviet economy. If uh, in Russia uh, the uh, mineral resource uh, enterprises were the most efficient and then in the Ukraine the transportation infrastructure was the most efficient. So. Uh, the um, tasks of the elites in Russia and the Ukraine in the 1990s were different. In Russia, as Mr. Etkin wrote in his book, uh, there had to be people disciplined and ready uh, to solve uh, national and to attain us uh, uh, and uh, to implement uh, uh, national projects, uh, which uh, predetermined uh, uh, the people from the security agencies uh, to uh, come into the government. In the Ukraine, uh, there was uh, indeed uh, a short-term uh, fraud-style um, uh, authority um, uh, was uh, indeed uh, the factor uh, to influence uh, most importantly on uh, the so-called elites uh, in the Ukraine. Well, uh, in both cases, in Russia and Ukraine, uh, sociopathy and the unwillingness uh, to observe some established rules and to manipulate the masses were among the most important. The Ukrainian elites uh, were more um, inclined for horizontal communication. The Russian elites uh, were ready uh, to um, obey uh, the um, elites uh, in the above and uh, the so-called noisy multitude of civic uh, Organizations is a rare thing to see in the post-Soviet space. In such places as uh, Belarus, it's almost non-existent. In Russia, uh, under um, President uh, uh, such a multitude of civic organizations were quite uh, widespread. Uh, however, uh, the imitational uh, methods uh, and the reduction of uh, the financing sources uh, were undermined uh, with the third term of President Putin the Russian legislation 
uh, started to support uh, immediate bans uh, and the civic life uh, uh, is only in the backyard of the municipal movement, the religious organizations, uh, uh, the modernization potential of which is not particularly strong. The Ukrainian civic society turned out to be uh, uh, more um, stable and uh, more uh, uh, impulsive uh, and instrumental. However, uh, the Ukrainians have gone through uh, two cycles of crisis in 2004. Um, when uh, the oligarchies, the oligarchs brought to an authoritarian regime uh, which accumulated the terrible mistakes, uh, the revolution um, washed away the old regime, the Democrats uh, came uh, with the some promises and again it led to authoritarianism. And, uh, at least this is the experience of Ukraine. But being a part of the vertical of authority, the local self-government uh, it is still subjugated to the center. Both in Minsk, uh, in Moscow, and in Kiev, we can see uh, how the, say, in the Ukraine, starting from 2009, the Council of uh, Ministers uh, is uh, uh, indeed uh, establishing the local budgets, but uh, it is not in a position uh, to uh, continue uh, or to verify the needs. Uh, thus, in this way, we're seeing this uh, uh, Simon Kordonsky uh, patron and vassal relations between the majority and the minority uh, territories in the Ukraine. And with the, all the potential of self government and municipal self government systems, uh, we are seeing uh, critical times and the dire straits of the so called internal and collective immigration. Towards uh, the second decade uh, of the 21st century, we are seeing societies in the post-Soviet space established and based on uh, personal relations uh, within the elites. Uh, the private property uh, is uh, extremely weak um, in uh, terms uh, of its uh, uh, security, and uh, the Ukrainian elites uh, have not been able to build a reliable democracy. Uh, the Russian elites have been able uh, to get uh, used, uh, um, uh, and uh, the so-called Euromaidan uh, led uh, uh, did not lead to any uh, strong uh, uh, transit uh, of uh, democracy, and indeed. Uh, the democratic motivation which led uh, to the beginning of the Ukrainian revolution were indeed uh, supplanted with the motives of the so-called collective uh, uh, survival. Uh, the uh, Russian intervention and the civil war uh, in the Ukraine uh, uh, gradually and very strongly led to a strong decline in the support of the democratic transit and indeed uh, uh, we can see that the tendencies uh, for democracy will be uh, indeed uh, uh, arrested. Uh, uh, I think that in 2014, uh, the uh, authoritarian regimes uh, have uh, uh, won a great uh, victory. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, the uh, Moscow is the great uh, lawmaker. Uh, in terms uh, of uh, very strange uh, um, control and the comic uh, lawmaking uh, in Russia is a symbol of demodernization. Uh, the uh, tribalistic moods uh, are seen in, um, in the Ukraine and Belarus uh, is uh, uh, humbly awaiting for the death of its patron. Uh, the peoples in this uh, cyclic, in this visual circle are wasting and squandering times of their life. We're seeing uh, uh, alternative scenarios of uh, demodernization. Uh, the de different anti-modernity levels, uh, an era of new barbarianism comes uh, when the veneer of uh, civilization was too thin.
and uh, this uh, demodernization of creative works leads to a squandering of uh, the resources uh, of our societies. However, the hope is still with us, and let me quote uh, Jürgen Habermas, uh, the German philosopher, who said that modernity is an, uh, is an open-ended project, and this is indeed one of our last hopes uh, to continue um, reconstructing and refreshing uh, the modern times uh, and uh, reforming uh, our uh, political regimes uh, by getting uh, back uh, to the ideas of individual liberties and freedoms. Uh, thank you for this. We will uh, only pass to the questions uh, later if we have time. But we shall now uh, uh, ask, uh, we, we shall be talking with the uh, Georgian colleagues by uh, colleagues. Uh, let us now pass to Armenia, uh, Mr. Armen Zakarian, Director of the Armenian School of Political Studies, uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Alexander Iskandarian, Director of the Kutus Institute in Armenia. Um, good evening. Uh, good evening. Um, first of all, let us uh, thank the Moscow School for this initiative. Uh, that uh, the schools representing the first Soviet states uh, may have this unique opportunity for dialogue. I think that this initiative um, will uh, continue to evolve. Great and many thanks uh, to the uh, director and founder of the school, uh, to uh, Lena Nimirovska, to Yuri Sinakosov, and to the family of Shemelovs, uh, uh, who have uh, um, indeed uh, made extraordinary efforts uh, to make uh, this uh, project uh, uh, real. Let me give the floor to one of the uh, leading experts, uh, Armenian experts, Mr. Alexander Iskandarian, the director of the Caucasus Institute in Amin. Thank you. Thank you, Armen. Uh, good evening, colleagues. You know, I shall depart uh, from uh, the uh, topic and uh, I shall uh, depart uh, from uh, Dr. Minakov. I have uh, problems uh, with the topic itself. I do not think that the post-Soviet uh, space, uh, in the sense uh, that we're talking about it now, exists. I think that the difference uh, between the post-Soviet uh, states uh, is already so big that uh, it would be um, uh, uh, not prudent to, to unite uh, uh, a conventional or imagined Tajikistan with an imagined uh, Estonia. Um, I think that uh, semantically this is uh, an empty exercise. I think that the first Soviet states have uh, diverged so wildly in their vectors of dev development uh, that we Moreover, if we talk uh, um, seriously, uh, the Soviet Union, uh, uh, the Soviet Union ceased to exist in about the 1950s in the way it was conceived. Yes, indeed, there was a unified system. It was called a unified system of uh, management. It was uh, formally. Uh, the same, but the party committees, uh, the industrial um, uh, control, and the KGB. However, uh, these uh, institutes uh, had a very different uh, meaning uh, in different parts of the so-called Soviet Union, while these uh, models of uh, management and government in the central Russia um, uh, were uh, meant one thing in central uh, Asia, uh, they uh, meant uh, the representative uh, of uh, local or even uh, tribal elites in the Transcaucasia, 
these were some uh, legal uh, models uh, for the so-called proto proto-bourgeois uh, systems. Uh, but uh, even without going uh, so far back, uh, but if we pass it to our uh, present time, uh, where we're from or we're currently springing, uh, these are country. There were there are countries which have hardly had any any change, uh, where the Soviet uh, rule has uh, been retained in almost the same way. There were countries uh, where um, uh, which uh, underwent uh, extremely uh, fundamental economic, communicative, and other uh, and other changes. Uh, uh, they say and they speak about uh, um, some uh, unity. One can speak about uh, uh, the uh, relations between Lithuania and Poland, uh, uh, then between, say, Lithuania and Kyrgyzstan. In this sense, uh, the uh, the uh, um, Soviet space uh, is indeed uh, not what we may think about it. Yes, indeed, we're all post-Soviet, uh, but uh, in the same way as all the Mediterranean cultures are, are post-Roman. After this preamble, let me pass on to, to the issues of Armenia. Armenia, as any, as any other country, has some peculiarities um, in terms of the history of its historical uh, path, uh, starting from the beginning of the 1990s. Now, let me first say that uh, uh, the Soviet period was indeed a modernity, and a modernization which led uh, to a very uh, modern, for that time, a modern society with a developed uh, um, industrial sector, uh, science, uh, and uh, technology. But this is, of course, uh, Soviet modernity, a very specific style of modernity. I'm not an economist. Uh, I do not know how much can we believe these numbers, but about 90%, they say, of what the Soviet Armenia produced uh, was, uh, uh, was uh, military complex. Uh, Armenia was a part of the huge military-industrial complex of the Soviet uh, uh, union and uh, all of this was uh, demolished uh, in a matter of a day. Uh, that whole um, enormous system was uh, dismantled uh, from uh, from uh, uh, from Yerevan. There was uh, um, the Soviet. Uh, uh, the Soviet Armenia, there was a whole range of, uh, of cities uh, um, uh, uh, with the, the great uh, military uh, industrial complex. Uh, all of this, of course, uh, stopped and was, was stopped existing in a matter of a day. The mountainous uh, uh, Karabakh complex started, uh, the Abkhazian uh, complex started, uh, the um, a landline between uh, Armenia and Russia was uh, severed, and hundreds of thousands of people in cities and the towns uh, of Armenia urbanized uh, with the existing uh, uh, scientific and educational level, uh, with the skills uh, to live uh, in a, uh, what we might call a modern society. They uh, indeed found themselves uh, in a, a situation which is which are entirely different. Uh, that Soviet modernity died. But something else started. The reforms uh, um, uh, started. Uh, the construction of what we may call uh, an agrarian uh, complex uh, of a third world country. The economy of Armenia today, even of today's uh, Armenia, is is a well developed um, uh, African country if we compare it in terms. Or, or say a mid-developed uh, Latin American uh, country. Uh, so we're seeing some agriculture, some uh, uh, mining, uh, some uh, food industry, some processing industry, um, some services, uh, and that's about it. Even those uh, 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 modern uh, um, uh, 
fields uh, such as uh, uh, diamond uh, making uh, and uh, high tech uh, are developing not in the Belgian but more of an Indian style. Uh, this uh, uh, disparity between uh, the highly urbanized, highly educational mass of people in Armenia and the actual reality um, of that country um, creates some uh, very uh, striking paradoxes. Um, the birth rate is about uh, two persons per family uh, and uh, the population of the country is generally uh, uh, well educated uh, about uh, um, the um, as I said population is highly urbanized two-thirds uh, um, of people live in uh, the um, uh, of the population live in the capital and and the economy uh, as I said uh, is that of a um, imagined uh, Senegal with the population of an imagined uh, Sweden. Against that ba background, uh, we're seeing the war, which was indeed started, Armenia uh, stopped in its uh, uh, development of a statehood and political system with the Karabakh war. Um, formally speaking, this was an external war, with relation to Armenia because it was uh, raging between the self-proclaimed mountainous Karabakh Republic and Azerbaijan. However, um, for the um, Armenian uh, uh, society, uh, this war uh, was a major factor of the past uh, and continues to be one of the major factors of the past 25 years. On the one side, this was a, a point of consolidation of the society. Uh, around these uh, ideas, um, uh, the ideas of uh, national liberation, uh, or, and on the other hand, this was uh, uh, a matter of uh, of uh, making Armenia an encampment. Uh, the army uh, in Armenia was born before the state. Uh, many of the structures in uh, today's Armenia uh, were. Uh, indeed um, coming from what we may call today the civil society. The reforms, very liberal reforms, were a way to survive, which was indeed uh, one of the uh, unique examples when uh, non-centralized but uh, liberal uh, reforms uh, were conducted. Uh, thanks be to God, we do not have oil, and we do not have a major uh, mineral wealth. And for Armenia to survive, um, it uh, must have uh, earned a dollar. Uh, the Armenians, indeed, uh, to survive, had uh, to uh, to uh, make it uh, make a, make a, uh, a cent. Uh, so there can be no Soviet Union where there is uh, uh, the uh, small and mid-sized business. Indeed, uh, uh, this uh, mid uh, uh, size uh, and small size business was developing in Armenia uh, from the very grassroots levels uh, because people had to survive. Uh, uh, having developed, uh, uh, it uh, became uh, very typical for the post Soviet state uh, where business and politics uh, came together into a sort of a, a compliance of an oligarchy. And, uh, The ar archaic uh, um, element uh, came to the fore, and the people who had uh, worked uh, uh, in uh, the uh, scientific institutions uh, or uh, uh, that who had been uh, uh, scientific uh, research fellows, uh, they had to become uh, now uh, uh, the. Um, they had to to uh, sort of pass into a very a different uh, social uh, stratum. And the war, although it was uh, successful, uh, and if it was not Armenia, uh, but the Armenians uh, who had won the war, uh, and uh, uh, the consolidation or the social cohesion started to dwindle. Uh, the uh, 
demand, the social demand for the further development of democracy uh, led uh, to a striking contrast, uh, which we're seeing uh, uh, in all of the uh, so-called Southern Caucasus or the former Transcaucasia, because uh, uh, this uh, uh, part of the Southern uh, Caucasus can be viewed as uh, one and the same region, even only probably if an observer is somewhere on the moon. We, the uh, Transcaucasian countries, uh, are very much different. Uh, and uh, these uh, economic hardships, uh, the economic difficulties, which uh, uh, lived, uh, led uh, to the development uh, of uh, nostalgia for the Soviet uh, times, in Armenia, uh, they led uh, to a somewhat different view, the gradual uh, rotation of government. Uh, presidents do change uh, in, in, in Armenia, places uh, change, rotation takes place, but the society does not accept this. It does not accept politicians and it does not accept politics as something legitimate. Uh, the uh, general uh, uh, attitude of plague on your houses uh, is extremely common in Armenia. People view politics as something which is extremely removed from their lives. Uh, and the models uh, uh, a, a good word for this. I think that um, Dr. Minakov said it uh, very properly. Uh, the imagined, the imagined. One has to imagine um, your political reality. And the democracy in that uh, geographical region from which I speak, uh, 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 democracy is taking root here for the first time in history. The experience of uh, the first Armenian Republic in 1918 and 1920, uh, the models of the 1918 uh, can hardly be taken into account seriously today. It just uh, was in existence uh, for only two uh, uh, years. But uh, the reference uh, can hardly go there because of uh, uh, very few political traditions had stayed. So this was the Soviet Union. Um, um, before that, it was the, the Russian Empire, the Persian Empire, uh, the Sublime Court, uh, the, the Empire, the Byzantine Empire, the Assyrian Empire, and all the way down into the uh, nooks and crannies uh, of uh, history, a uh, very ancient history. So it is indeed a, a very, very new thing in Armenia that we are seeing uh, today. And uh, we can see that uh, there are some new forms and uh, formats uh, which are being uh, uh, viewed uh, and uh, filled in with content which may be alien uh, to uh, the Western democracies. But as I said, people are generally uh, full of apathy. Mm. And uh, the voice uh, of these, the voices of these people, unfortunately, are quite easy to uh, buy. Not necessarily in the direct way, of, such as uh, paying uh, uh, people. No, this could be by, say, uh, indirect services, uh, um, such as uh, building the road uh, or trying to explain uh, that uh, uh, the teachers will get uh, uh, a bonus. Uh, 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 people are uh, being uh, taken uh, to the ballot box, not in ideological, but rather in very pragmatic way. Well, people uh, in, the, in the former um, Soviet uh, uh, some of the former Soviet republics, uh, it really does not matter how people vote. Uh, but in Armenia, the situation is uh, somewhat different because their vote uh, uh, has a certain 
important so but on the other hand it is not possible to buy my vote for 20 kilos of potatoes not because i'm i'm so um high moral or intellectual but because i have uh, 20 kilos of potatoes and the vote of a person uh, who does not have 20 kilos uh, of potatoes uh, some elderly um, a lady or a peasant from a, um, a mountainous uh, village um, his or her voice uh, could well be purchased uh, for 20 kilos of potatoes and this is extremely difficult to overcome such a situation so uh, the development of business uh, can be viewed as the only way uh, to help uh, people uh, 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 in, uh, uh, in overcoming their immediate uh, economic hardships. And the development does take place. Let us say, let us take the civil society, let us take the structure of the civil society. Those, uh, let us take uh, the people uh, who uh, uh, decline to vote uh, for uh, for money or for some uh, uh, menial material uh, goods or services. Uh, um, indeed, we're seeing that uh, Armenia is uh, becoming uh, more and more associated, uh, or at least self-associated, with the European space, uh, which of course uh, viewed uh, um, as a generational thing. Uh, and an urban thing. However, we can see this. Uh, I am teaching uh, in uh, here in uh, this country, and I can see that about uh, two thirds uh, of my students uh, uh, speak uh, uh, English better than they speak uh, Russian, which is certainly non typical to, uh, for my generation, because uh, Russian uh, has been a family language in. The educated classes, uh, um, uh, but uh, uh, going uh, and studying in Europe, spending time in Europe, taking part in a conference uh, um, is uh, becoming uh, more and more of a common thing. Unfortunately, it has been a long time since I last saw a man who would want to go and study at, say, Chelyabinsk State University. So this is a matter of cultural dynamics, which eventually leads uh, to some sort of a um, to some sort of a political dynamics. And I can see that uh, today's um, Russian uh, vectored uh, politicians is uh, one of the last uh, or penultimate of the uh, the Mohicans, and uh, the um, sort of uh, younger generation of politicians in Armenia are people of a post-Soviet era. They are people who view uh, the world uh, in a different way, at least uh, on the uh, level of uh, ideology. If um, the ideas uh, of a democratic transit uh, um, have not been rooted, however, in terms of ideology, they have well been uh, um, uh, 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 appropriated. Uh, and indeed, uh, there's hardly anybody in Russia who would say today that democracy is bad. Indeed, democracy is not an act, it is a culture. It is a culture which means must be uh, 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 built. Uh, democracy cannot be. Um, uh, built uh, by signing a treaty or a constitution. It is a space. The constitutions uh, can be rewritten, indeed, or amended and changed, and this is quite normal. Why should we invent a wheel for the second time? But uh, what is created on paper is a form which has to be filled with the content. Uh, and uh, this process is unfolding in Armenia. It is uh, 
developing uh, uh, in a uh, in fits and starts, but as a political scientist, I think that this uh, process of democratic transit is uh, 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 is uh, changing uh, and uh, developing. Uh, I uh, think that uh, in historical terms, uh, we have only uh, seen a fraction of uh, time. So I think that. Uh, If you, if we view this uh, as a process uh, rather than uh, um, uh, rather than a start, an act, then uh, something will indeed uh, come out of this. Thank you so very much, Mr. Uh, Iskanderian. We shall leave the questions uh, for later. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, our men. Uh, Thank you for saying that there is no uh, a united uh, space, uh, and even though you said in the beginning that uh, uh, we, we do not live in, in a unified space, post Soviet space, however, your subsequent uh, um, uh, 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 intervention uh, showed us differently. I would like to ask. Um, about one thing, which is of principal importance uh, to the to the um, modern uh, societies, uh, the rule of law, the judiciary. What is the situation uh, with the judiciary and the rights of the people? Are the courts uh, working um, in a proper way? Are people prepared to go to court, or uh, they're uh, ready to indeed? Um, to indeed uh, prone to uh, address extra, extra legal ways. Uh, well, uh, unfortunately, uh, the legal consciousness uh, has not been rooted in this country. In uh, general, unless we take... Uh, Unless we take some extreme criminal uh, cases, uh, uh, the courts. Uh, um, I think that uh, uh, people try uh, to uh, settle their problems uh, in uh, in uh, um, extra uh, court or extra judicial way, and uh, the courts uh, are not uh, independent which is indeed uh, one of the reasons um, of the failing uh, um, consciousness, legal consciousness. Uh, so I would, uh, I would have to uh, acknowledge uh, that the judiciary in this country is not independent uh, from the executive. But uh, in the social center of Yerevan, uh, people are generally more and more uh, inclined uh, uh, to um, rely on courts. Let's just say uh, I'm driving a car, and about five to seven years ago, uh, the corruption, uh, the traffic police was uh, was indeed uh, um, rife. But uh, after the uh, police reform. Uh, this has indeed uh, changed uh, uh, dramatically. Uh, the police uh, cameras uh, make the photos, uh, and then we get uh, we get to the fines. So I can get uh, a passport uh, three uh, weeks ago. I can I can get my passport in say three weeks, or I can uh, I can get a passport in one day if I pay premium uh, for the agency fee. So there are some changes, um, and uh, it is difficult uh, to uh, to um, foresee when shall we see a, a mass uh, change of consciousness. Uh, but I think that there is some uh, progress uh, in the legal consciousness. Uh, um, in uh, in the uh, 
in the so-called urban uh, and educated uh, population. And we shall now pass uh, on to uh, Belarus. Uh, Mr. Alis Mikhailevich, uh, Doctor of Political Science, the Presidential Candidate of the Republic of uh, Belarus in uh, the elections of 2010. Well, first, to agree with my colleague uh, from Armenia to the fact uh, that, um, that democracy is primarily a cultural thing. It is indeed a dimension of culture. Uh, Belarus uh, is not a country uh, uh, Belarus is not a country which has uh, which is uh, democratic uh, and uh, there has long been uh, a common phrase that Belarus is the last dictatorship in Europe. Uh, however, as we see today, uh, this phrase uh, almost uh, sank into oblivion even in the European uh, uh, political rhetoric because uh, Belarus is uh, far from being the only problem with authoritarian regimes or far from being uh, uh, the only country where, where there is a great uh, um, authoritarian uh, tendency. And, uh, uh, but that's not something that I wanted to, to speak about uh, in the first place. Uh, for democracy to take roots, it is uh, critically important for people to have a practice of democratic procedure. It is uh, um, especially important for people to understand how democracy works. Uh, there is a saying that the Swiss uh, uh, democratic system is very good, except for one thing, uh, one little thing, uh, for the for the uh, uh, Swiss dem democracy to be built, uh, uh, it takes uh, the Swiss uh, people to do that. And indeed, it is always a question about these Swiss people: how, um, the, the, uh, how, and where can we get uh, these uh, Swiss uh, people who know how democracy functions? who know the procedures and who are ready to um, implant uh, this into their soil. And looking at the example of Belarus, uh, looking at uh, uh, the situation in Belarus, uh, uh, the uh, organizations of civic society, party, political parties and trade unions we can see that uh, the practice of um, local self-government of municipal councils, which uh, eventually uh, led to a situation where people knew what is democracy, uh, that this uh, local self-government uh, system generally stopped um, working as such. And this inoculation of democracy um, is uh, pretty much gone from the social space. When we speak about the Belarusian uh, press and the mass media, we can see many. Uh, there, there is a saying: uh, a fight for democracy or a struggle for democracy. I think that uh, it is not possible to struggle for democracy. I think that a struggle for democracy. Is, is indeed struggling for peace so ardently that uh, there will be uh, nothing uh, of the world left um, uh, but ruins. Uh, democracy can only be expanded. Uh, it can only take, uh, uh, take up more and more of our life. Uh, it can only be developing through education of people. Uh, how many times in our practice uh, in uh, Belarus, in Russia and elsewhere have we encountered a situation whereby uh, the political parties, uh, the political parties' uh, uh, members uh, were ousted uh, for uh, for criticizing uh, the party bosses. How many times have we seen a situation when people, on the one side, being pro-democratic, uh, who have uh, uh, accepted democracy, uh, but uh, um, have uh, never uh, took to mind uh, to exercise democracy in their uh, lives. And indeed, uh, we can see a, a recreation of the Communist Party. 
we can see this in Belarus and in other countries. So what I would like to to say in uh, in conclusion is that uh, without uh, serious uh, serious uh, internal expansion of the democratic practices, of the democratic procedures, without uh, teaching and educating people as to how this thing works, uh, how these mechanisms uh, work, we shall never come closer uh, to uh, understanding um, uh, democracy and uh, indeed uh, uh, for this to work um, I would like to remind you that Mr. Lukashenko came to power as a result of democratic elections. These were indeed the first and the last democratic elections uh, in uh, in the history of, of contemporary Belarus Republic. In 1994, um, uh, the Mr. Lukashenko came to power, uh, who was very uh, quick. Uh, to build uh, one of the most uh, highly centralized authoritarian systems in uh, uh, modern Europe. Uh, so to avoid to avoid uh, uh, a situation when, uh, as a result, uh, we uh, bring uh, another director, and indeed uh, to avoid uh, this recreation of authoritarianism, uh, democratic practices and procedures have to be indeed uh, we woven into the tissue of social life without internal uh, democracy without local self-government without press uh, trade unions and political parties without building and developing a high political culture which uh, presupposes uh, consensus um, Without all these uh, things, uh, we would not be in a position uh, to uh, build. And without this, the Belarusian um, case is very interesting. Because in spite of the long-standing history of the authoritarian uh, uh, government, uh, the civil society is still evolving. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mikhailovich. Our, your case is uh, very interesting to us. Um, uh, Mr. Minakov uh, uh, has uh, used a word of a, a Belarusization um, or, or uh, things uh, taking a Belarusian turn. Oh, if I may just add a couple of words. That, yeah, I'm very, um, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, very, very sad that the term of uh, a Belarusization or the things taking a Belarusian turn are used as a synonym for throwing authoritarianism. Unfortunately, uh, this can be seen not only in. Uh, in uh, the authoritarian um, regime, but I have to tell you that uh, the survival test tactics, the survival tactics, and the civil society tactics uh, are very important uh, as an experience that can well be shared by other uh, peoples and nations. Well, thank you very much. That's exactly what I meant, and indeed, your experience is of special importance to us. Um, I, I do not know uh, how well. Uh, uh, do you uh, do you perceive uh, the Russian situation? But could you, in a way, compare these uh, two countries, Russia and Belarus, in several parameters: uh, uh, the independence and freedom of press, uh, NGOs, the NGO sector. Uh, how could you compare Russia and Belarus uh, political competition on the national and regional level, the judiciary? Can you really stand your ground in court? Uh, in uh, so, uh, could you say a couple of words about these uh, two um, parallels? Well, uh, referring to the words of our Ukrainian colleague, let me say that uh, uh, Belarusization was first taking place in Russia, and the Belarusian practices were were, were uh, uh, gaining a firm ground in Russia when um, Mr. Lukashenko abolished local self-government and uh, this was done in Russia 
uh, very soon. And the Belarusian practices uh, started to be imported into Russia. However, one of the key differences between the two countries has been formulated by uh, Mr. Bukowski, uh, dissident Bukowski, who said that in today's uh, Russia, as distinct uh, from the Soviet uh, Union, it is easier to kill a person than uh, to put him in jail. And in this sense, uh, uh, Belarus uh, is uh, more Soviet, uh, in the sense that it is still easier to jail a person than to kill him. And in this sense, it is still uh, one of the key differences, uh, um, uh, which can also be seen in uh, in uh, in terms uh, of um, of uh, mass media and NGO sector and uh, uh, the judiciary. In terms of the formal comparison criteria, I would. Uh, um, I would uh, refrain from introducing these because uh, the so-called uh, um, self-censorship uh, uh, is important. Uh, the factor uh, uh, of uh, Russians uh, being fearful for their lives, uh, and this is something that uh, that we saw in the regency in of Russia for the past. Uh, uh, 20 years, and nothing uh, has uh, changed much, uh, because there were some central um, uh, figures uh, which were sort of kept uh, away from trouble, or no longer they are, but in the Russian regions, uh, people were uh, feared for their lives. So in this sense, uh, uh, when you're starting uh, to compare the bad and the very bad, I think it's just very different. I think that the mass media uh, is not a question to me. Uh, the NGO sector, we can see uh, the NGOs, uh, and in terms of the judiciary, both in Russia and Belarus, uh, it was uh, never uh, viewed as an independent uh, branch. So this is indeed one of the major problems of our countries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alice. Thank you very much um, for this uh, very interesting uh, contribution. So let us now pass on to Kazakhstan. Uh, Mr. Pavel Kokchashev, founder of the Institute for Development and Economic Affairs. Good afternoon. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you for your invitation. Um, uh, Kazakhstan is uh, going through a pre-electoral uh, period. Uh, next uh, Sunday, uh, Kazakhstan will go through general elections uh, and uh, presidential elections, uh, and uh, these are um, extraordinary uh, elections, uh, which are just a technical uh, reason uh, to do that, uh, to initiate uh, these um, elections, and uh, this is one of the examples uh, which shows um, a peculiarity of Kazakhstan uh, in the past uh, um, years, and indeed the, the general Kazakh uh, history, one of the um, formulas uh, uh, proclaimed by President uh, Nazarbayev on, on Economic first, politics second. Uh, being an economist, I can say that uh, there are some serious achievements in terms of um, GDP growth, uh, direct foreign investment, industrialization. However, as usual, Uh, there are comparisons uh, to be made um, with um, the uh, coterminous countries, um, Uzbekistan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, and uh, unfortunately uh, the, it would not be proper uh, to 
um, draw such comparisons and conclusions. So here I would like to support Alexander. The differences are quite uh, conspicuous. But uh, in terms of uh, the post-Soviet uh, space, I think that uh, uh, the, the greatest uh, parallels uh, can, are with the Russian Federation, um, uh, together with uh, Belarus and Russia. We uh, have for a long time been uh, the so-called backbone of uh, the so-called Eurasian, Eurasian Union, and within the framework of uh, uh, this, uh, we are under direct uh, economic influence of Russia, as well as direct uh, informational influence. The audience of the Russian TV channels is uh, dominant in Kazakhstan, and uh, we can see uh, this. Uh, uh, also, in terms of the state support for the mass media, as measured in uh, billions of tenge or um, hundreds of millions of dollars, about uh, uh, 300 million dollars uh, as uh, assigned by the government uh, for the state uh, TV channels, uh, which is indeed uh, the instruments of state propaganda. I imagine. Uh, uh, and I uh, represent uh, the generation which was indeed born at the time of the breakup of the Soviet Union. I was born in 1990, and uh, I grew up uh, in a uh, in an inter independent Kazakhstan under the um, rule of uh, the uh, current president. Uh, Unlike, uh, say, Armenia, we have not had any changes in political elites in the past uh, years, which can be um, viewed in different ways. Uh, but uh, when, when, in terms of uh, the young generation, uh, the young generation do not seem to see this as a problem, uh, as as if uh, the personality of the president of this country. Um, uh, is viewed as pretty much uh, as one's uh, grandfather uh, who has been uh, with you throughout your life uh, on the TV screens, on the city uh, billboards, uh, on the pages of newspapers, and um, this personality, um, and, and this uh, social phenomenon has not been studied uh, on, in terms of Kazakhstan in depth. Um, one has to say that uh, uh, one, even though there is no uh, Kazakh, Kazakh uh, economic miracle, however, there is some tangible growth, and there is a very, very little protest uh, movement, uh, which means that uh, the elections um, are quite uh, routine, um, without much intrigue, without much interest on the part of the public, uh, and uh, with uh, without uh, many. Uh, alternative uh, candidates, uh, so they're really taking place as uh, some sort of a um, background. Uh, uh, the motive uh, for these elections have indeed been uh, defined by by the fact that the peak of the crisis has already been passed, and uh, that. Uh, had, had we not had the extraordinary uh, uh, elections, uh, so these uh, extraordinary uh, elections uh, have been conducted. So we have never had ordinary elections uh, in the past 20, 20 years. So this is indeed the characteristic um, of, uh, of a mobile and at the same time uh, a dirigible uh, character of uh, state policies, because uh, the institutes uh, are not uh, balanced. So we are a super presidential republic, and we can see that uh, on the on on the example of many um, different. Uh, Cases uh, that uh, the ministers uh, can well be uh, uh, 
shifted between uh, the different uh, 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 like between oil and uh, and uh, regional management so on the one hand it's a rotation but it's a rotation within a very uh, narrow elite it does not seem we do not seem to have any political ambitions with the young generation yes uh, there is some um, there is some demand for social lifts for the new uh, young and educated ambitious people to go up for in the social hierarchy however we do not see this uh, happening here. let me also mark remark uh, a very careful foreign policy by the Kazakh government because being under a uh, very strong influence uh, from uh, Russia uh, Kazakhstan is not in a position uh, to uh, have uh, the full-fledged uh, multi-vector um, development in the foreign policies of having good relations with say the US uh, uh, and Russia and China and say uh, um, uh, India so there is, there are certain uh, uh, certain concessions uh, that had to be made because of the sanctions imposed on Russia and we can see how unstable the economic uh, the, uh, the economic achievements have been uh, they have indeed uh, been uh, um, shadowed uh, they, they indeed took place uh, these achievements were reached uh, with the high oil prices and uh, now the country is in the period of uh, of um, um, economic hardships uh, in terms of the lack of liquidity even though these hardships may not be fundamental but uh, we can see some trade wars uh, um, developing uh, Ross project not door may uh, ban some products and then Kazakhstan may ban some of the Russian imports uh, some uh, little um, uh, Demarche uh, or um, such uh, local trade uh, conflicts uh, are only um, indicative of the fact that business is uh, is in a very unstable uh, environment. And even though the business uh, plays uh, a pretty, an important role in uh, Kazakhstan uh, politics, and the National Chamber of Entrepreneurs was this two years ago, and these are indeed uh, a way to uh, air the grievances uh, this is the vent uh, to air the grievances uh, and uh, this is a way to um, try and solve uh, some of the problems in relations with uh, with Russia but in, in terms of Belarus the situation is different because there are not many direct uh, relations or economic projects that could uh, bring Kazakhstan and Belarus together in in the recent times there's some uh, uh, there's some apprehension uh, there is some um, intellectual fomenting uh, among the intellectuals, which can be seen in the social media and the paper and and the newspapers. Uh, the potential threats looming on uh, Kazakhstan and Kazakhstan's sovereignty and independence because of this uh, very dynamic uh, Eurasian integration, and this uh, in turn in the past uh, year or two will become a basis for political activization because uh, if you see this as an open political discussion then it has to start with something 
and uh, some uh, uh, some uh, uh, not very careful steps on the part of the Eurasian Commission, which is often confined uh, to lobbying uh, the economic interests of the major Russian oligarchs, uh, may indeed lead to political activization inside of Kazakhstan. Uh, against uh, the background of the events in the Ukraine, we are seeing that uh, there's been an opinion that uh, Kazakhstan must must hear the consequences of uh, uh, of the European uh, of the Ukrainian events, but about seventy percent, over seventy percent of those. Uh, uh, sampled in the sociological polls are generally pro-Russian and uh, and quite radical um, towards uh, the uh, radical against the the position of the Kiev government. <laughs> With this said, we have some uh, resonant uh, legal cases, court cases. And uh, threat to, to the national uh, unity when um, uh, uh, Tatiana Shevchenkova was uh, indicted. Uh, so obviously this is a precedent. And the only positive um, argument is that uh, uh, Kazakhstan is a is an island of stability. Uh, the government itself is not uh, um, is not quite sure if it can uh, sustain this uh, stability, uh, especially um, uh, when we hear that uh, more and more people from Kazakhstan go and uh, and uh, uh, join the Islamic State and other um, uh, radical. Islamist groups uh, in the Middle East. So much so for about the political environment and uh, the circumstances in Kazakhstan. Thank you very much, Pavel. This was uh, Pavel Kokushin. This was Pavel Kokushin, uh, founder of the Institute for Development and Economic Affairs from Kazakhstan. A very short question. Kazakhstan is a Eurasian country, as Russia is. In some ways, Kazakhstan uh, is a part of the, say, European uh, structures. Now, say, in football, and we went to Strasbourg together, where we represented a small Kazakh delegation. In your view, Does Kazakhstan uh, and people in Kazakhstan view uh, themselves as part of uh, Europe or more Asia? Or uh, is Kazakhstan perceiving itself to be a bridge between uh, Europe and Asia? Well, I think uh, Kazakhstan, we, the Kazakhstanis, <laughs> and, and that's a uh, Generally speaking, uh, a, a statement that I liked that uh, we uh, are a civic nation. This is what I heard in uh, President Nazarbayev's uh, pre electoral uh, speeches. At the same time, we have uh, a big stratum of young people who studied abroad. Uh, there was a big uh, program, over 10,000 uh, people have studied uh, in the best uh, foreign international school sponsored by the state. And uh, generally speaking, uh, the view is 
that uh, it's a more of a pro-Western trend, which is uh, being seen in Kazakhstan. when we give uh, our assessments and evaluate uh, this, uh, this is more of a, um, Kazakhstan today is a liberal economy, a market economy. It strives uh, to be a better place. Uh, there are some economic strategies. And there's some uh, World Bank criteria. So th there is more of a pragmatic approach. A desire to become um, a strong economy and a for Western uh, uh, tendencies are quite conspicuous in uh, today's uh, Kazakhstan. We shall now pass on uh, to Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan, Elmira Nogoibayeva, head of Analytical Center, Polis Asia. From Kyrgyzstan. Hello, uh, I'm from uh, Kyrgyzstan. Um, uh, I would like to say a couple of words about uh, Central Asia because what is happening in Kyrgyzstan can be uh, viewed uh, um, in comparison uh, and uh, of course uh, the Central Asian region. In Central Asia, Central Asia as uh, as a region. We can only view it as such outside of Central Asia itself. Inside this region, we do not know much about each other and the countries uh, which we border. And we represent quite different political systems. Turkmenistan, for instance, is uh, celebrating the 20th uh, anniversary of its neutrality. On the 22nd of March, Uzbekistan held presidential elections. And on the 26th of April, we shall have presidential elections in Kazakhstan. And in both countries, the presidents have been in power pretty much from the very beginning of the statehood of these nations. Almost for almost a quarter of a century. And uh, what I would like to do uh, is. Uh, uh, is uh, to refer to Mr. Minakov's words about the Soviet modernity. You might remember the great mega project of the Soviet uh, of the Soviet uh, uh, period about the uh, all Soviet uh, electric electric system. Herbert Wells Wells did not uh, believe uh, the plans of Vladimir Lenin. But he was uh, shocked uh, to see, very much impressed uh, to see these uh, uh, mega um, construction sites. After the states became independent, uh, this mega project uh, is indeed affecting the relations between the states. That process was uh, primarily united with the spirit of cooperation, and the breakup of the Soviet Union led to very deep ruptures, including the ruptures in infrastructure, and we feel the terrible consequences of these ruptures until today. These are related with very painful um, issues such as electricity and water supply. These uh, circumstances and factors uh, mar the relations uh, between the states and governments of the Central Asia. In terms of Kyrgyzstan, we are still a post-Soviet state and we can uh, see the tendencies um, coming to, from, uh, from uh, the uh, Uh, from uh, the sort of Russian metropolitan um, uh, area, and uh, in uh, talking about the uh, perspectives of Kyrgyzstan uh, and its uh, um, outlook uh, of uh, integration with the Eurasian Union, let me say a few words about very strong uh, political 
influence and the media influence and pressure in Kyrgyzstan and it is these which are responsible for formulating the general social and societal attitudes towards uh, the majority of events taking place in the post-Soviet state, including say the events in the Ukraine. In addition to this, uh, the uh, processes of de-Sovietization have uh, now been uh, substituted with the processes of re-Sovietization. Or Soviet uh, um, Renaissance recolonization of the conservation of region, including Kyrgyzstan. Uh, I think that uh, there have been no elections in Kyrgyzstan there have been no elections in Kyrgyzstan uh, uh, where uh, the running uh, candidate would not try to correlate their pre-electoral programs with the Kremlin, with Moscow. We are seeing that the discourse coming back, uh, or the general statements coming back about the state being small, that it uh, lacks in strategic resources. And indeed, uh, Russia is viewed as uh, the great flagship uh, uh, in uh, the wake of which Kyrgyzstan um, uh, must uh, follow, at least uh, um, in. Uh, there is a tendency to the so-called vertical of uh, authority. And even though Kyrgyzstan is a parliamentary republic, there are many initiatives uh, and attempts uh, to increase uh, uh, and to strengthen uh, the power of the president. And in this sense, I think that we are uh, copying uh, the Russian uh, legal uh, system uh, and the normative uh, uh, paradigm whereby many of the Russian laws and many of the Russian uh, bans such as the ban on uh, the NGOs or the homophobic law um, many of the norms of the Russian legislation are just being directly copied to the previous standing environment. Uh, the um, uh, copy of the, and, and the uh, very, very um, urgent talk about the foreign agent law is viewed as, viewed as, viewed as a replica of, this, of the Russian law. And such a demonization of the NGOs, of the independent media, um, of, uh, and, and the uh, anti-Western uh, sentiment uh, are the things uh, which are um, indeed uh, viewed uh, um, as a part of the Kyrgyzstan discourse. I think it's a most important point. So, we are seeing some tendencies of a re Sovietization. And the political system and its, uh, the apparatchiks, uh, to avail of the Soviet term, um, refer back uh, to the Soviet uh, terminology, or at least the sentiments. Um, the constitution of Kyrgyzstan is viewed as one of the progressive ones, and it has been corroborated on a number of occasions by the Venetian Commission. In Kyrgyzstan, there is uh, uh, a parliamentary chamber, uh, the former constitutional court, uh, which has uh, two major um, segments. Every citizen of Kyrgyzstan may turn to the uh, uh, to this uh, chamber of uh, parliament uh, concerning the constitutionality of each and every law. 
in uh, in parallel, say in, in comparison, in Kazakhstan, the parliamentary constitution chamber uh, is not a place that every citizen can go. But in Kyrgyzstan, we are seeing the tendency of narrowing uh, the field and uh, strengthening the presidential power. And these are two norms. May well be seen. Uh, Kyrgyzstan, in terms of democratic institutions, is one of the uh, one of the um, most developed uh, civil societies in, uh, in the region in Central Asia. We have uh, a great uh, NGO uh, uh, sector. We have many NGOs in human rights uh, and in other spheres. In April of this uh, uh, year, we are um, uh, having the so-called the fifth uh, anniversary of the so-called. Uh, uh, last uh, previous revolution, uh, unconstitutional, another unconstitutional change of government. So indeed, uh, there have been risks because uh, the protest uh, attitudes are going up uh, um, related uh, to the growth in um, in uh, prices, uh, the uh, uncertainty of uh, the accession. Uh, to the Eurasian Union, polarization of the political discourse. It is no secret that apart uh, from the Eurasian um, Economic Union, there are many organizations which are trying uh, to advocate the ideas of, uh, of Eurasianism and uh, the so-called Russian world, or Ruski Mir uh, society, uh, is quite uh, detrimental uh, to the concept of uh, the Russian world itself, because we're seeing uh, quite a terrifying uh, substitution of, uh, of two things with ideology, whereas uh, the actual uh, Russian culture and Russian language space in Kyrgyzstan is indeed shrinking. And the buffoons of the Ruski Mir are indeed uh, uh, trying to uh, reanimate um, the, some of the communist uh, sentiments uh, at the expense and indeed to the detriment of the space of the true and genuine Russian culture and language. Elmira, yeah, thank you. Uh, if I may ask a question uh, that, uh, that uh, Sasha uh, um, asked uh, Father Kokchushev about the general uh, vector in the society. Does, it, does Turkish society generally view itself or in any way view itself as part of Europe? Or? Well, Kyrgyzstan, I wrote an, an article that uh, Kyrgyzstan is like a time machine. We have had uh, field studies, we have some uh, some uh, Lacune or some some uh, remote places in the Fergan uh, Valley, where people who live there, it's a very archaic society. I would not really have uh, I would not really have uh, talked in terms of East and West uh, or Europe and Asia. I would have used a different scale. This is a uh, 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 modern, postmodern, or archaic society. In such societies, we see, we see such archivization. And uh, if we look at uh, big cities, there are some very advanced uh, there are some very advanced uh, societies. Uh, and part of the Kyrgyz society in terms of media, technology, and so on. But uh, it's a, a very mosaic picture, a very fragmented picture, I'd say. Uh, let me pass on uh, to Ekaterina uh, Zhilakova, editor in chief of Municipal Authority magazine. Uh, good evening. I'm very glad to, to be here.
it is my pleasure uh, to, uh, to meet you online. Some uh, may think that uh, what I have to say is not going to be of such uh, importance uh, as sort of my esteemed colleagues have said, have said, but I will try uh, to say a couple of words about the uh, Municipal Authority magazine, giving some cases um, over the past 18 uh, years. At the Moscow School, I have often spoken as an optimist, uh, and I generally think uh, what, uh, that what uh, the, the um, regional or provincial life uh, shows to us in Russia prompts us that uh, civic initiative is not that is not that bad in, in Russia, and if the civic uh, local initiative is allowed uh, to grow and flourish, it uh, will and would uh, increase uh, and improve uh, the quality of life in these Russian regions and municipalities. However, what I would uh, like to do is to uh, bring the quotation before uh, and prior to every Uh, quotation before every okay. uh, the uh, quotation is from Andre Damatayev, one of the prominent experts on uh, uh, municipal self-government. Uh, he worked for the presidential uh, administration under President Yeltsin and under President Putin, and uh, in the last years of his life, he uh, came to. Uh, to an agreement, uh, to, to a conclusion that we have uh, not translated uh, adequately the European Charter on Local Self-Government, which the uh, Russia acceded to in 1997. When we made uh, the main sub-object of such authority is the municipal body, uh, whereas in the original European Charter, the, uh, the citizens or the communes the citizens are the source of this municipal authority. And uh, such a phenomenon has uh, set the vector for the development for the municipal authorities for many years to come. But when I look over my shoulder, and when I try to analyze uh, the events uh, of the past years, I can see many very inspiring uh, examples. Um, and it is always related to the uh, character of a person, to the charisma, to the attempts uh, of a specific people to change uh, their surroundings. If we remember the 1990s, we might remember uh, that uh, people may remember the say, Chernorechia uh, village in Orenburg region or Kamaja in Mordovia. The examples that I may, uh, that I may quote uh, are related to the economic uh, life. So Chernorechia village in the Orenburg region in the 1990s. The chairman of the village council uh, started to uh, Sue uh, the um, regional authorities and uh, was able to get paid back uh, with the taxes that had been levied. So he went through many uh, court uh, proceedings and he was able to stand his ground and the court uh, upheld his uh, um, his uh, plea. Unlike many other places uh, in Russia, which were quite unsuccessful in trying to uh, uh, litigate, Kevnadechia uh, was able to stand their ground and uh, to get compensated for the taxes levied, uh, which indeed uh, uh, changed uh, life in the village. Uh, they 
um, started uh, and they repaired uh, the school and uh, were able to start paying the tithes. Um, the Republic of Moldova, by far not the wealthiest republic in Russia, a farms, um, farmers' a community evolved in the Tamaeva village, um, presented by Nikolai Shinkin, uh, the late Shinkin, who was uh, uh, a deputy of the regional um, uh, legislature. They had a very strong farmers' uh, community. Well, they did not have uh, much of a conflict, uh, but uh, they were able to stand uh, for their interests uh, and uh, they were able to uh, they were uh, indeed uh, um, withstanding uh, the mafia and the criminal element trying uh, to raid uh, their farmers. Uh, so this was some sort of a farmer's republic which uh, is now almost a legend and there were able uh, to improve in a uh, radical way uh, the quality of their life. In the same way, they were ready to initiate uh, some uh, local uh, things. Uh, let me take uh, the example of the city of Pirm, which uh, even before the Cultural Revolution, But there is uh, one of the the beginnings of the so-called uh, and stands uh, at the source of the uh, local self-government initiatives. Uh, Perm was a very poor city, and uh, the um, citizens in the city of Perm. having gone through being stimulated, were able to solve the problems which had not been solved for decades, such as uh, uh, waste disposal or construction of the uh, sports complexes. And when the mayor's city of Affair started to uh, control and to try and supervise uh, what had happened, they saw that the actual every ruble invested into these uh, citizens, uh, organizations and the free associations had brought uh, um, uh, an almost six ruble a return on every ruble invested, which is a, a grant or maybe a brilliant example of how such local self-government bodies may work. Firm became one of the sources of uh, local, regional, and uh, provincial um, um, uh, initiatives, uh, which had then uh, been uh, taken to other 11 um, federal uh, districts, say in the Volga area, which indeed had started in Firm. One of the interesting examples uh, was. Uh, the work of Gleb Turin in uh, the Archangel region, who was one of the graduates of the Moscow School, and who was instrumental in saving the dying villages uh, through his energy and inspiration. He would come uh, to uh, the uh, village which was dying, uh, he would inspire the locals, uh, and in those places where uh, indeed a village was bound to die, um, he was able uh, to um, uh, to uh, revive it uh, to life. Now, in some cases, the villages uh, were becoming uh, tourist centers. Uh, in uh, some cases, uh, I remember um, one of the great examples of when where a, a village did not have uh, uh, a water tower. So they did uh, revive uh, their, their village uh, just uh, solving the problem for 50,000 rubles, whereas uh, the contractors were asking for a million. Uh, our city, the, the town, the, the town of Mushkin in the Yaroslav um, uh, region, were able to um, make uh, Mushkin uh, into a, a remarkable uh, landmark 
and the fact of the initiatives of this uh, enthusiast, the strategy of the town of Michigan was developed as was supported by the major urbanists uh, of, uh, of Russia and the urban scholars, uh, thanks uh, to this uh, initiative of the town of Michigan um, acquired the major grants, became a tourist uh, um, uh, objective uh, and increased its revenue to the budget 10 times increased uh, the flow of tourists uh, from several thousand to almost 200,000 uh, people a year, which was all provenant uh, from uh, the ideas uh, of that one uh, bright man, Mr. Politico. Now, another uh, case also related to tourism. And uh, tourism is indeed um, a very important venue for a lot of development. And a very vivid example, which I'm always trying to consider, is the Kolomna in the Moscow region, where everything started with the um, with, with the actual desire of the then mayor of Kolomna to uh, to indeed uh, get rid of the historical core of the town. However, uh, the uh, Kolomna uh, people uh, were able uh, to create a museum complex. As citizens or activists, uh, uh, they uh, got some grants uh, from Vladimir Putin and Vadik uh, Alekseyev, and they created a museum and created workshops. And as a result, the downtown of Kolomna, where the historical buildings must have been uh, demolished uh, at the decree of the, of the previous mayor, uh, they now own this, these buildings. And this is indeed uh, the home for the museum complex of Kolomna, which is uh, known across the country, which is uh, indeed a tourist mecca for the for the coterminous uh, regions. There are also some territories where the citizens uh, um, are able uh, to. Uh, change uh, uh, the nature of their surroundings and make a change and make a comeback. Let me just uh, um, name uh, Yaroslav, Yaroslav uh, where uh, there were some uh, major performances uh, and fairs uh, um, were uh, conducted and indeed became the basis uh, for changing the very urban tissue of the city of Yaroslav. And these people in Yaroslav, uh, now uh, present Yaroslav in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, urban uh, center. There are other projects, and some of these uh, projects are uh, concentrated uh, on uh, the center of applied um, urban studies. And uh, here, we're trying to accumulate the experience which allows uh, to uh, restructure the very life in, uh, in, the, in the localities of towns and cities. Well, we don't have my, I don't have much time, and uh, what I would like to uh, conclude with uh, is to say a few words about elections. We know uh, that uh, those who are interested in the history of local self-government, there is a new stage that we're entering, uh, whereby the regions have been allowed to introduce 
the city of uh, the concept of city managers. And this is uh, a, a very contested topic, that reform. But that reform was uh, conducted in spring of last year. And uh, when we speak about uh, the uh, summary, when we speak about uh, how the reforms uh, were uh, realized, and in both cases, uh, such uh, freedoms uh, and uh, authorities uh, were passed uh, to the city managers. If we try to differentiate between these, uh, it would be quite uh, interesting to see that the elections, uh, the direct elections, were only retained in those places where the government was strong, where the so-called uh, common European values had been retained and uh, indeed uh, kept uh, alive. And it happened so that these people were standing their ground and they now have more freedoms because of this uh, uh, um, uh, office of city manager. So I think that this was generally a very inspirational, uh, uh, a very inspirational uh, approach from the standpoint of local self-government. So these are the examples I wanted to share with you, and uh, I think that the conclusions uh, can be different, and they're evident that uh, such a popular local uh, creative work uh, and initiative. Uh, on the grassroots level, will eventually make it uh, make itself heard. As illustrated by by some of the examples I quoted. Well, I think that um, uh, this was interesting uh, because uh, it is difficult to speak about democracy in Russia. But she was able to find a case. Um, which she was able to, to find a case uh, where democracy is at work. So even in, uh, in uh, the absence of uh, political competition or uh, some uh, civic stance, uh, uh, this is uh, possible. Uh, and uh, and indeed uh, the state machine is being substituted with the actual uh, uh, direct uh, civic participation. Let me try to call Armar. Choice for democracy is impossible. The society of democracy is impossible if such a choice, this choice, is not posed on an individual level. Unless we, as individuals and people in this society, unless we make a choice within ourselves, unless this is an individual choice, then uh, democracy in society would not materialize. The experience of the past 20 years in my country proves my point. What we see in the society and uh, in uh, the so-called uh, um, establishment, uh, this uh, duplicity uh, is uh, what we see as an important uh, um, peculiarity of most of the false Soviet space, because talk of democracy talk uh, and talking about democracy seems to be very popular, and uh, and uh, 
confession. But uh, what we prove is that without an individual choice, uh, the people cannot uh, get uh, in terms and cope with losing that power, which is indeed one of the reasons why democracy is not acceptable to so many people who are afraid of democracy, who are fearful that uh, uh, that uh, democracy is against them. Unfortunately, there is this experience, there is another experience which is also positive. I don't have uh, time or indeed uh, the opportunity to analyze the political development uh, of uh, Georgia in the past 20 years. It is beyond the scope of this uh, telephone conversation, but if we speak about the major consequences, you will see that on the one side, you can see that the development of the society was making small steps uh, towards uh, democracy. But uh, very few people in the societies, or relative, uh, a small number of the people, understood uh, that uh, this is something that people have to struggle for. This is something that people have to participate, that nobody will make democracy work. It is important to understand that people have to make a conscious choice. People have to understand that uh, it really depends on them if democracy would flourish. Without that, the so called soccer diamonds will continue to grow. The crocodiles will have to learn to speak the language of them. But these are very dangerous. These are not the crocodiles who live in the rivers and lakes. These are the creatures who do not accept, who do not accept democracy uh, to, uh, uh, to become the main one. To summarize, I think that it is important that the only to say that the only way for a proper democratic development in the post Soviet space or in the post Soviet states, including Georgia, is on the one side the political and democratic culture, and indeed the formation of democratic culture, which is only possible through education, through enlightenment, and multiplication of the number of democracies. And indeed democracy is not possible without democracy. to bear great responsibility for the society for the humanity. It is a choice for struggle for democracy to the bitter end. There is no other choice uh, for the people in the post Soviet space, including Georgia.
but without willing to say that um, we are trying to, to uh, be overly um, lofty, the experience of development in the past few years shows that the country was more or less, more or less prosperous, only in those cases when the Democrats had uh, the right uh, of the, or, or the, the voices could be heard. The more Democrats there are in society, the more chances there are that the society would continue to develop in a democratic way. And that this part would be the only uh, 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 part. Thank you very much, and thank you for your emphasis. Uh, about the individual issues, that it is a collective, an, an individual and not a collective thing. I can only agree with you. I cannot agree more. And indeed, this is an individual choice that has to be made every day. Then, if I may ask you a question, how many do you think people in Georgia have made the choice for themselves? I think that among those who participate in the political life in my country, I think that uh, uh, th there there are um, many, but uh, uh, probably not uh, sufficient um, number of people who have made this. So we're talking about the people who vote. And indeed it is the question of seeing how much and where do we move. Because this has to be like a, a cold shower. A cold shower for those people who must understand that uh, People are voted for, they're elected, and that they're elected through a specific mandate. So, indeed, we're still few, unfortunately. Thank you, Armand. I hope that this is not. Uh, our uh, last uh, uh, meeting, and I hope that we shall continue and um, we're very glad that the word of Georgia was heard during this uh, uh, this uh, teleconference uh, between uh, the uh, um, uh, civic school different countries. Well, thank you for that, and thank you uh, for taking this moment forward. Uh, let me pass on to Andrei uh, and Veronika Kogleshova, communication managers of the social movement Honestly from the Ukraine. Oh, uh, friends, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was uh, very interesting. Uh, we are ourselves uh, uh, graduates and alumni uh, of uh, the Moscow School of um, 2011. Uh, it's a great thing for us uh, to to participate in this uh, uh, in this uh, teleconference, and we understand that our societies are um, encountering uh, challenges which are somewhat common in nature. The political practices. Uh,
and uh, together with Mr. Nampusuk, we have uh, decided uh, to see how this uh, society has uh, changed uh, there in English. And uh, these will have been uh, sociological um, uh, focus groups and NGO and uh, focus groups in different parts of the UK. So these slides are in English, I will be showing them. And uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see the screen. No, 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 we can see you, we don't see your screen. Oh no, let me see, let me come to it. No, we do not see you, we do not see your screen. We can only see you, your face. No English interpretation of these slides will be provided. Only 2% of those polled have asked anything negative about English. So freedom was number one. Freedom of speech. This is the as as the name says, democracy of clouds. The semantics of democracy. So we hardly have an, have any non democrats. This was a very well representative focus groups. Partially democratic, according to this picture, and there, there is a way to go through it. So democracy is, is reviewed by and by many in comparative terms. We are more we in the Ukraine are more democratic than Russia, but less democratic than you. So Cancelling entries and unities uh, were viewed. Uh, as one of the important uh, symbols of democratic change. So, cancelling MPs and unities, uh, uh, however, may well uh, lead to quite an undemocratic uh, change where my uh, MP who do not have the proper administrative resource or financial leverage may well be ousted if the uh, nascent uh, uh, or the current uh, um, uh, form of the Euro uh, Ukrainian uh, democracy follows a wrong path. A few words about uh, the views of uh, uh, civic activists. Specific society is viewed by many as a volunteer society. There's great respect for volunteers. There's great, uh, there is a view that the volunteers um, support the army and that they have to go into the government. Civic activists are viewed as people who are ready uh, to. Uh, pick up uh, uh, the job of the government, but there are fears in society that they may 
um, get uh, rotten. Or, as the example goes, when uh, a cucumber is put into a jar with pickled gherkins, it becomes salty or pickled. And so uh, this is the apprehension. Talking about the electoral uh, um, processes on the example of parliamentary elections, uh, let me show you the slide on the structure of the electorate of the main parties by the age groups. Uh, the radical party, Pravi sector, uh, did not get uh, any seats, and some of Cornish. Which uh, united uh, many uh, different people from uh, the. So the communists were mainly voted for by the elderly voters. And we can see the trend. We have not particularly, oh, this is not particularly uh, successful. Mr. Poroshenko's party is right in the middle. Interestingly enough, uh, in the rural areas, uh, the situation uh, was uh, viewed, uh, well, the, the situation was, was almost. Uh, um, Identical as the one described above, except that Zastik uh, got a uh, high, uh, high profile, and uh, of course uh, Mr. Leshko, the Ukrainian counterpart of Julian of the Conservative Party, also had a high uh, profile in the rural area. Those uh, but Kipshina, but many urban. Um, Dollars, the private sector is very high. I have to tell you that uh, it is not uh, particularly easy uh, to find a topic which would unite people more than the idea of um, of uh, of uh, the support of the decision of the Russian Federation Parliament to send its army to protect Russian speaking citizens in the Ukraine. So the number of people who do not support this idea went up to 89%. Um, there's also a share, very few people, the Russian speakers uh, who think that they need to be protected. So, what has indeed changed um, is uh, the attitude to, towards Russia. Especially uh, Only 17% uh, of the Ukrainians are of name or view of the integration into the Customs Union. Up to 59% uh, of the Ukrainians uh, view of, of themselves as part of the European project. Not in my view, uh, we have just uh, leaped into a vacuum from the first Soviet space and we do not seem to be um, uh, gathering uh, much strength in becoming an integrated part of the European project. But the electoral democracy uh, in the Ukraine is, uh, has a very um, high uh, oligarchy uh, factor. But uh, interestingly, Mr. Kolomoisky, who apparently abused his uh, authority and uh, was, uh, was uh, so. For Mr. Kolomoisky, it ended with a, with a dismissal. So the electoral uh, picture changed considerably. Look at this uh, picture, the change of attitudes.
you can see uh, how uh, a dramatic change uh, in those people who voted for Mr. Kravchuk and those who voted uh, for the so called uh, pro Russian voters. There's a big number of people, a growing number of people in the Ukraine who believe, of course, that the future belongs uh, on them only, in the sort of locus control. The people who think that the problems and the solutions are within themselves. But uh, in terms uh, of uh, the institutions, it would be... Um, premature to say that we have democratized many of the practices. Our parliament has shown itself uh, to be a stable institution, it's true, which um, was uh, able to abolish uh, the dictatorial um, laws. But in terms of the local uh, people, um, people of course are still uh, very immature in terms of using the democratic instruments and, um, uh, and uh, they do not have a fair knowledge of what democratic procedure is. Interesting that Gromada is not uh, in itself a civic uh, um, and not a community, it's something, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's some sort of a community um, a, a, a Ukrainian uh, concept and people um, on the sites uh, try to use it. In an interesting way, many people um, have do not have much faith uh, in how they can use uh, the results of the reforms uh, uh, in uh, the municipal areas. So myself and many of my colleagues are trying to bridge the gap. But uh, Mr. Poroshenko's electoral slogan, we shall uh, live uh, um, a new life, uh, um, it is not quite clear how, sh in what will be the novelty of this uh, life. So, interestingly, that over 50% of the Ukrainians are ready to suffer for the reforms uh, to succeed. However, uh, uh, this uh, view of the future is not uh, yet uh, quite. Uh, Clear. So I think that in many ways uh, this will depend uh, on how successful we are to allow people to use the democratic instruments. Otherwise, the Ukraine will unfortunately um, uh, downgrade uh, to another uh, time of a feudal arrangement in this uh, postmodern era, and the local oligarchs uh, will pick up uh, uh, the power. The government is not uh, particularly uh, uh, popular, but uh, generally speaking, uh, the, the people are uh, uh, approving uh, of uh, the educated uh, people from uh, from abroad uh, taking up offices, uh, and the general sacrifice uh, uh, has been growing in the Ukraine. Oh, about 70% of the Ukrainians in 2014 um, donated, uh, so it's not more, much more about sacrifice, but the donations, the number of, uh, of those who donate uh, uh, time, uh, money, uh, 
resources uh, to something outside of their immediate concerns is an important uh, factor of the social life in Ukraine today. Interesting uh, developments in the prosecutor's office, the attorney general's office, uh, and uh, the, the, the many of the uh, corrupt officials are indeed uh, in awe. Uh, the judiciary is still very slow, and uh, they are very serious in getting prepared for the local um, election. But we're trying to make it in such a way for people to understand uh, what is the sense of their participating. So this this great gap uh, between uh, the society and uh, at large and the civil society itself. So on the one hand, there's a bridge um, uh, crossed by the volunteers. On the other hand. We fear that there can be a disappointment on the part of the public at large in the municipal uh, self-government. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, so much so, for the sociological palette of the Ukrainian Today. Uh, but the two very dynamic developments in the Ukraine, I wanted to ask you when uh, there's something to depart from, for example. Uh, this is not bad. Uh, say, um, Russia has uh, become a successful country which is difficult to depart from commonly. But then this anti-communism, which is some of your anti-communist laws, how is it possible not to become a mirror? Because anti-communism is not democracy. Talking about uh, propaganda and communist symbols. So, indeed, uh, uh, some of this interpretation can be used for push and gain. Well, I agree with you. Yeah, this is an extremely, extremely dangerous populism, institutionalization of such uh, bans and limitations. And uh, there is a practice uh, of, uh, of a whole number of uh, packet of laws that should be taken. There's a great uh, temptation uh, to use uh, the slogan of war, or, or because the, the objective of any of any um, uh, authority is is authority, and uh, uh, power is uh, corrupting. Absolute power corrupts absolutely, and there is a uh, Pashinsky and uh, criminalizing uh, the, the critic of the government, and uh, and we understand uh, in the civil society that uh, the good intentions uh, take uh, pave their way to hell, and banning communist propaganda. Unfortunately, um, may indeed be a mirroring. It's a bad law, but it's probably not as terribly bad as I thought ori um, um, uh, originally. And it is uh, primarily, it's it's not a very good trend. I agree. We have, uh, but it was difficult to, to stand our ground anyway. And we have to say that freedom of speech in this sense was very hard uh, because many people believe it to be an important um, step in the development of the country's political and social system. And we shall indeed try to uh, propagate um, uh, these uh, values of the freedom of speech. And I do agree with you, Svetlana, that there is this uh, zone of risk, a big rose zone of risk, uh, and uh, hatred uh, may unfortunately become such a factor.
But indeed, I wanted to ask a question. Uh, can uh, democracy, is democracy possible in, uh, in a country at war? Mr. Gretchen from, from Nova Sibirsk uh, wrote a comment uh, mm, uh, compared with a neo Bolshevist experiment. But uh, Alexander, uh, this is of course uh, an obvious interpretation. However, there are some dangerous uh, tendencies. The point here is that, uh, in, in our view, that people who may be associated with those who sympathize with the enemies are losing any rights are ousted and the society denies them? Well, that's a good question. Well, I think that any democracy must be localized. It must be, and we walk uh, near Prokofiev, um, I think there are very different parts. Near uh, Prokofiev, Uzhgorod, Chernovsky, these are very different parts, and we have to be very honest, uh, looking at uh, at every city in in its uh, in its uh, uh, isolation, can uh, the city dwellers, the citizens of the different uh, cities, can they keep this? Because because the central government is not particularly strong. You have to realize uh, that uh, we do not have this great uh, tradition of um, of uh, cohesion around the central government. But uh, the society, per se, let's just take the Facebook society. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly not uh, um, scared by the by the uh, common people, the people in the street, the folk in the street. The Facebook audience seems to be a lot more radicalized. I don't watch, um, but uh, there are no legal mechanisms. I thank you to God uh, to uh, to uh, try to marginalize uh, the dissidents. The ban on communist propaganda may be viewed as uh, trampling upon the freedom of speech. But uh, I have to tell you that the communist, uh, pro the, the the ban on communist propaganda only deals with the um, with the legal entities and not private individuals. So you can do anything uh, at home. Uh, you can probably do it on your on your balcony. But but uh, in the private sphere, uh, there is no ban on communist propaganda. But our society has indeed uh, matured, but it also has been radicalized too. And the pain is uh, is accumulating, uh, the, the pain of uh, the losses. But uh, for a society at war, and for a society at war on its own land, is still quite liberal. Because uh, Martin uh, Luther King only started to speak about the war against Vietnam uh, several months before he was killed. Before he'd never even raised the topic. The Russian society, which is not at war, uh, at least nominally, has a, a terrible a hate speech and hate rhetoric. So I think that there is some uh, help eternal in, in the Ukrainian society, and we don't think that everybody has gone mad, but we're trying to now monitor the situation very closely and try to tell the truth at least uh, to say to speak truthfully to each other i do not see any risk uh, in publishing whatever i wish on the facebook and especially i do not see any risk emanating from the state institutions or the government they may come from different societies or from different uh, um some some sort of uh, uh, people who believe uh, that they should silence me but at least i do not see any any danger emanating from the state or the government. So uh, it's not the state that is uh, trying to paralyze my social or political activity. In this sense, uh, 
thank you very much. Thank you so very much. And uh, well, I hope that the dialogue between our countries will continue and deepen. We only have 10 minutes. Uh, and I would like to get back to Mikhail Minakot, if he still hear us. Yes, I can hear you. If Mikhail could help us uh, to make uh, a conclusion. Well, thank you very much. It, is, it has been a most interesting, the most interesting uh, discussion. It is uh, a, a pity that we do not send, uh, sit around the true physical around the world. I think that my primary conclusion uh, that uh, we are seeing an interesting uh, confluence and uh, and rivalry between archaic and the modernity, uh, the uh, modern processes and uh, and the pre-modern processes, and I think that this is what we have seen as a main thesis uh, in uh, my colleagues' intervention. But just a few other uh, points. An important subject uh, has been uh, raised by Pavel Kokrushev, which is important for, for, for Kazakhstan, Russia, Ukraine, that our political regimes, even in those places where there has been economic success, has not been able, have not been able to sustain the success. It's both um, a tragic and an optimistic note. So the Leninist uh, cynical statement about uh, the worse the better can work. Um, Putin's uh, consensus, uh, the Putin social contract so at the beginning of, um, the of, of the 21st century, of the first years of the 21st century, whereby the state uh, provided for the income and uh, the citizens um, give up their political rights and no longer works. And the citizens may well remember that freedom is a long term investment into one's future, in the future of one's children, and the future of one's uh, property. And I think that uh, this is something that we're seeing in Russia, Kazakhstan. And I think that uh, this issue of uh, private property rights uh, may indeed uh, become very urgent if, uh, say, uh, the uh, owners uh, are disloyal to the government. And this is something that uh, plays a big role in, uh, in Russia, too. I'm uh, following very closely the processes in Azerbaijan. Uh, the fall of the oil price uh, must uh, indeed uh, radically uh, affect uh, the regime in Azerbaijan. And the um, intervention of our Armenian uh, colleague was very interesting, not only in, uh, in uh, its radicalism, but Mr. Iskandarian, uh, I think, uh, has emphasized um, very interestingly the dubious uh, thing such as uh, the conflict uh, between uh, the urban population and uh, and uh, the rural population. I'm indeed um, uh, involved in an interesting project so that we could try to provide uh, for the equal rights between the cities and the rural areas, the doomed people, the people who don't have any any uh, access uh, to any services, the medical services, or, or even the minimal services, how to bridge this terrible gap, how to rebuild the democratic regime, not only in uh, the form um, and format of uh, freedoms and liberties, um, but also as uh, a access to services. We have to speak not only about a democratic regime, but an inclusive uh, democracy. And this is what all of, uh, of uh, our um, uh, presenters uh, today emphasize. Finally, I would like uh, to finish uh, these uh, remarks, uh, conclusive, conclusion remarks, 
by the very important topic um, broached by Ales Mikhailevich, which is the individual experience of participatory democracy. People in post-Soviet space often uh, use um, democracy as a somewhat as a blurred concept, but indeed democracy is about sending your ground, standing the, um, uh, guarding your interests, the interests of your community, the interests of your people. Um, and uh, this uh, struggle for the right is a key thing. The uh, Maidan in uh, Kiev uh, uh, um, made indeed uh, uh, the, the precedent of uh, stopping uh, uh, authoritarian uh, rule, uh, giving a chance uh, to the society um, uh, to uh, start uh, with the judiciary uh, of independence, and there is a window of opportunity and there is a decline. If in two years changes do occur, then uh, uh, the victory has not been uh, in vain. Georgia has an interesting experience, whereby the victory of the Revolution of Roses uh, led uh, to most important reforms. And um, while we in the Ukraine uh, speak about uh, tendencies, in Georgia, Saakashvili's group was able to, to conduct uh, reforms. Indeed, in the Ukraine, there is a great uh, demand for this Georgian accent, as they say. So this uh, experience uh, is extremely important. And it is especially important uh, for this experience uh, uh, to be shared. Uh, I hope uh, dearly that this will not that this is uh, not our last uh, discussion, and I hope uh, for this uh, continuation of a uh, polyphony. Um, and I am very thankful to the Moscow School and to uh, to uh, Svetlana and uh, Alexander Kmelov. Uh, the founder of uh, the school, uh, Yuli Zagorovich Sinakosov, uh, wrote. Uh, uh, I remembered at the end of the 1980s, uh, the telebridges between, between Russia and the United States, uh, the perception of what we were seeing is so vivid and very bright given. There is, I think, a difference between the end of the 80s and today. Those telebridges were uh, indeed organized by the states and indeed were a symbol of some detente uh, in the wake of the Cold War. In uh, our life, our states are diverging and in some ways uh, 2014 became uh, a third and a final milestone of, uh, of the breakup of the Soviet Empire, which existed uh, in uh, this Eurasian space first as a Russian Empire and then, then as a Soviet Empire, and there is no way back. I think that the states will continue to diverge wildly, the relations will be. Um, the better or for worse, uh, more and less complicated. But uh, I think uh, there is uh, an attempt, and there is uh, there is a chance uh, to try and uh, conduct and uh, to indeed uh, strengthen the dialogue between the societies of these countries. Because in spite uh, of all the differences between our societies, the problems that we encounter are generally very close and similar. And I think that uh, I could uh, hear uh, something uh, very dear to me. So, the study of such experience, supporting contacts, is of, is of a greater and ever growing importance uh, uh, if. Uh, especially if the contact between the state dwindles. So both as Mikhail and Svetlana, I would like to
to express uh, a dear hope that this is not our last day of polio uh, uh, and that we shall continue this in the future. Well, I'm certainly um, sure that we cannot uh, take anything from one country to another country, but we can share the experience. We should not transplant the experience, but we should share the experience. And I think that this was an important meeting, an important teleconference for all of us. I hope that this is only the beginning uh, uh, of a polylope uh, in uh, Mikhail Minakov's uh, apt uh, definition. And uh, uh, I think that we should be a civil society, not just in our own country, but in this uh, planetary uh, civil society. Life doesn't uh, stop, and I think that um, uh, I think that we are not focused on uh, age them of any ancient kids. Uh, I would like to thank. First, I'll say a uh, uh, because uh, uh, we have spoken about a generational uh, gap. Um, but uh, Alexei uh, was born uh, with a computer in his hand, so and thanks to that, uh, we were able to have this great uh, benefit. Uh, uh, and, this, and I would like to thank Mark that 